Hello, and today I have a very different video for you. On Sundays, my lovely friend Jen over at the Countess Powers channel and I join up together on Skype to have a chat, and often we'll save questions and topics to be discussed until that point. And on the last conversation we had, I decided a little bit impromptu to record that conversation. And I thought it was a really interesting conversation. So we'd like to share it with you. Please forgive the slightly rough and ready nature of the recording. But if you enjoy this conversation and would like to hear us have other conversations on this topic in the future, please let us know in the comments and I will endeavor to double end record the next one to improve the audio quality. But for now, Please do enjoy this conversation between myself, Kat from the Supernatural Beatles channel, and my friend Jen from Countess Powers. Hence, we're calling it Supernatural Powers. Okay, <laughs> Countess Powers, how did you get into the Beatles? Well, um, I got into the Beatles back when I was like around uh, 12 or 13. Um, mainly because I had a friend who was really into them. And um, I came home one day from like a sleepover with her. And I, was, I remembered my parents have this massive collection of vinyl records. And so I just started looking through them and I found all of these gems in their collection of Beatles albums. And also... Um, one solo album from McCartney. So I was introduced to them that way. And, you know, once I had the records myself, they were just on constant repeat when I was growing up. And definitely, I think, too, the, um, I, you know, because you're like me, like we kind of came of age in the 90s. That was when they were doing their anthology series, too. And that really sucked me in to the whole Beatles world. Me too. I watched all of that. In fact, I remember um, the year that they brought out um, Free as a Bird as a single. Mm -hmm. We were doing Secret Santa, and mm -hmm. I got that as a single for Christmas. That's an excellent Secret Santa you had. <laughs> yeah. Very that cool. Was. Yeah. Um, how did you first get into them? Um, dumb luck. Uh, 1987, it was the 20th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper, and obviously mm -hmm. the whole album starts with, it was 20 years ago today. Mm -hmm. So, the whole... Creepy. Exactly. The whole of the <laughs> Beatles' back canon was basically being replugged, and part of that sort of relaunch of all of those albums and paraphernalia was the films. They were mm -hmm. on uh, VHS... Mm -hmm. And I remember them being advertised. I still got them actually. I still got those tapes. Yeah. And I remember them Excellent. being. I remember them being advertised, and um, I didn't know what they were, but I was oddly drawn. And my mother bought them for me, even though she pathologically hates the Beatles. <laughs> and that was my introduction into the Beatles. It was actually through the films, which is why it was important for me to actually cover the films in my own videos, because that's where I started. Yeah. You've done amazing work there, um, highlighting the different, especially the, you know, programming and all of that that goes into it, so. Well, yeah, because yeah. that will lead me actually into another question. When I watched Help and then immediately watched Magical Mystery Tour, mm -hmm. that was when I realized there was more than one Paul, because mm -hmm. I thought of the Beatles as actors. And I remember watching that for the first time and going, oh, it's a different actor playing Paul. When was the first moment that you realized that Paul was replaced? Oh, goodness. OK, so um, honestly, um, it, it's something that I had, you know, heard of uh, growing up, mentioned here and there, like the joke, oh, Paul is dead. Um, I, I never really took any credence to it. I never personally 
um, I noticed a shift in the music quality from the Paul albums versus the Billy albums. And that's, that's really the only difference I noticed was the sophistication in their uh, compositions and stuff. Um, I actually didn't really realize that it was true until probably like uh, maybe five years ago. Um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm fairly new um, at the whole PID thing, but obviously, you know, I've always been interested in the quote unquote truther community, you know, and finding out what our paradigm of reality you know, really is. And um, I think me going through that knowledge first allowed me to actually be able to open my eyes and see that, yes, this replacement conspiracy actually happened. You can see the difference. Um, I think Tina Foster was the one who really uh, opened my eyes with all the photo comparisons to, you know, Billy and Paul. Um, so yeah, I mean, really, in like the last five years is when I discovered that. Sure, I can definitely relate to that. If I hadn't yeah. had a background of reading about and thinking about conspiracies, and mm -hmm. and that whole sort of get up, I would not be here now, that's for sure. <laughs> it wouldn't it wouldn't have made well, sense so like the first time yeah. you read memoirs when was that um so the first time i read um i actually got the abridged version billy's back in 2020 and um i thought it was very cheeky because when i received the book the postage on it was three dollars and 33 cents <laughs> I just thought that was awesome. Um, but yeah, it was, so I got the abridged version um, and then I got the audible version with um, Gregory Martin reading. And I was just like, I'm being cheated by the abridged version. I need to get the whole one. So I ended up getting the updated 2020 uh, memoirs and was exposed to the great wide mystery that is this replacement yeah so, what about you well i actually saw the memoirs the very first one being advertised on my recommendation feed on amazon and i ignored it and i feel like a fool now because <laughs> <laughs> i didn't actually buy it until the second edition came out 2018 that was mm -hmm. the first copy i have and i actually went back and got the four the first one and i've actually got all five or whatever it is versions of that book now nice see that's cool i i would like to do that i've have you have you gone through like obviously there have been updates in each you know each edition but have you actually ever sat down and kind of gone through and noticed the differences in the text in the main changes. text there are yeah. differences between the first and second version uh, mm. in, in one section, the bit where it's talking about how Paul crashed. Um, mm. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same in the main text. The differences after that are things like the footnotes and images and whisper messages and all of that sort of thing. Right. And I, I, I love the footnotes. I think the footnotes I um, just add so much to it, yeah. you know. They just make How it into a different book. How many times would you say you've read the memoirs? It's difficult to say because I've reread <laughs> some passages an awful lot. Mm. Read all the way through. I've probably read it all the way through, maybe three or four times. Yeah. But I've read, you yeah. know, individual bits much more than that. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I've only, I mean, I've listened to the audible version. I, I don't even know how many times, but yeah, reading it, um, it, I'm the same only twice. I've read it straight through. I mean, it's a lot of information and it's a lot of scary information. If you're not prepared to wrap your brain around it, you know, just all the Luciferianism and the control system, it's 
you have to be um, in a certain state of mind, I guess, to, I don't know, be open. Yeah, no, it's very, very true. I actually bought a copy for a friend of mine mm. and I knew that it would freak him out. So I bought him <laughs> loads of other books beforehand and made sure mm -hmm. that he'd read them all so that I was preparing him for it. That's smart. And um, <laughs> even so, he's found it really hard going. Mm -hmm. So even with that preparation, and he's a lot more open-minded to it than he was beforehand because it made him read a whole bunch of other stuff. That's anyway. interesting, though, that he's, yeah, still kind of. But, you know, it's like everybody gets there in their own time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. At least you've exposed him. <laughs> so, Yeah, well, he can see that there's more than one Paul, so that's a start. Yeah, definitely is. What, um, what interests you most about the story in memoirs? What interests me most about the story? Mm -hmm. like what part of the book is the most interesting to you? Um, curious, quirky things are interesting to me that actually have not that much to do with Paul is that terrible no not at all not at all <laughs> yeah. uh, example okay so obviously I like all the alien stuff love all the alien yeah. stuff um, mm -hmm. I like well what exactly like I'm, I'm I'm intrigued by the presence of other chapters like I've been intrigued as to the the presence of a chapter about Irish independence, the last chapter mm -hmm. where you have the, the, the talent contest. Right. You know, what's that about? Exactly in the same, same frame of mind. <laughs> I like right. look through some of those things and I'm like, well, what is the point of this? Like, you know, yeah. Oh, no, it, it, it must be there for a grander purpose. Right. You know, I, yeah. well, I, I have some theories on that, but I won't get into it now because it's too much. <laughs> I take over. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting though, you know, I find the um, learning about the actual sort of like rituals and, you know, um, I don't know, just confirming all of the ties to the occult with the Beatles. I, I find that topic the most interesting throughout the book. Anything that has, like, I really do enjoy the chapter, um, The Lovely Linda, like, I, I've always been curious about sex magic and how it works, and I feel like in that chapter, it was explained in a very clear way for somebody who is, you know, a <laughs> neophyte when it comes to magic in general, um, I, I was able to grasp the concept better of what the purpose of sex magic is through that chapter. And I, I just find that stuff interesting because it's taboo topics that you don't get a whole lot of information on, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think I've read enough about it just researching Crowley, to be honest. Yeah. Well, yeah, I definitely. But I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm just... No, that's fine. Too... I think that's a perfectly valid thing to say. Um, I, there was, yeah. there are, I think in every chapter there's something interesting, you know. Definitely. I mean, it's a hell of a page turner, isn't it? Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yes. dull it is not. <laughs> We've both kind of decided that um, we want to contribute to this community somehow with research or whatever. Um, what... Um, how do you come up with ideas for your research? How do I come up with ideas? That's a, actually a really mm. difficult question because mm. basically when I started making videos, well, actually, I never intended to make videos. I just intended to write things on Substack. Yeah. But when I started that, I just made a very long list of all the things that I wanted to look at and make videos or posts about and I'm literally just running through the list and that mm. is it and when I get to the end of the list I will magically disappear <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious 
that's why yeah. I work through them so diligently. And I tell mm. myself often, the sooner you get through this, the sooner you can go and do something else. <laughs> Serious. Yeah, but it's, it's like when you get to that point, though, when you think there's nothing more to say. There's it's not a case of there being else. nothing more to say. It's just nothing more that I can say. True. Which is not the same thing. You know, some That's things are beyond true. my capacity. And I have to pass the torch to someone else. Um, like me, I really just talk about topics that I find interesting. And I like to read a lot of online articles. So I feel like some articles I read are worth sharing and discussing. Others, you know, they just kind of add to the uh, backlog <laughs> that's in my mind, basically, of just different, you know, the, my basic um, goal with my channel was just to do tarot readings, you know. Okay. Um, but I also felt compelled to give my point of view on. I mean, yeah, and I guess it is my point of view. It's not so much like you where you're very balanced and like, you know, almost like a true journalist. I I tend to put more of my personal thoughts and beliefs into my topics and my research. Um, but that's just because I talk about topics that I find interesting. Yeah, I no, yeah. It doesn't do for everyone to have the same approach. You know, I'm a very sort of right. almost clinical minded person when I come to study a thing. I try yeah. not to put myself into the story. And yeah. um, I suppose like a journalist, you know, if, if you've become the story, then you're in trouble. Because yes. you should never be the story. And I try to be objective about what I see. And not always. Sometimes I throw in my own opinion, but not often. Right. And I, I've noticed that. And I think that's what um, makes your videos so powerful and impactful is that you leave it up to the viewer to determine the veracity of the situation. And I think that that's something that you do very well. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I do have a question real fast. You have a very extensive background in music and music theory. Um, you, um, you know, have done a lot with your, with your career as far as music goes. So with somebody who, who has such a grounded and vast knowledge and appreciation of music, do you consider Billy to be a musical genius that's a really hard question he's obviously mm. a very talented man mm -hmm. but the word genius gets banded around mm. and almost to the point where it's meaningless you know technically i'm going to get really technical on you now mm. technically <laughs> you'd have to have an iq of, you have to have an iq of something like 160 to be a genius mm. right and I don't know if you've ever gone through that kind of screening. I had to. I'm dyslexic and I have dyscalculia. And when I was assessed uh, last time as an adult, um, I had to go through a bank of what are essentially IQ tests. Hmm. Um, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever had an IQ test, actually. Yeah. I won't tell you what the result was. Um, it was above <laughs> average. Does that surprise you? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Not at all. Okay. Um, <laughs> It was above average, it was well above average, but it was not genius. And I would say that, you know, I was in a category labeled gifted. And I think that's where he is. I think he is gifted. You know, anyone that starts playing when they're three is gifted. I started playing when I was three. So he's clearly I gifted. I started when I was five. <laughs> was there you go. too late. <laughs> well, yeah. I, sp I, I mean, I started spontaneously playing the piano. I heard a mm. tune and I would play it. And that was as That's simple amazing. as that. I, I'm so jealous of people who can do that because I, I just, I've never been able to play the piano by ear or anything like that. So, well, I you know. know, if you start like that, it's actually difficult because then you have to have your ear broken 
And then once mm. you start reading music, then you have to relearn to listen with all of this new vocabulary that you didn't know before. It's, so it's, right. it's really weird. You go back and forth if you learn like that. It's interesting. So I think I, I think I've 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 recall hearing um, Billy even say something along those lines, you know. When he talks about, you know, being a musician and he, he always points out, oh, well, I can't read music. And it's like, well, you obviously can. Right. <laughs> and that's I could spot exactly. that when I was that's seven, I was you know, say. that you, you, yeah, are, you he, can read I've music. I've heard him say something like his dad wouldn't teach him because he wanted him to learn properly or something like that. But then he ended up not learning properly and never thought he could because he didn't want it to screw him up or whatever. And I, I mean, obviously that's Paul's story. <laughs> but, um, that's yeah. in fact the, the official narrative that you hear in, um, what's that guy's name? Mark Lewison's book, um, All These Years. The first volume I think is called Tune In. And that's the story that he relays in that book. That basically, um, Paul's dad wanted him to learn to play properly and he got him lessons with two different teachers in fact and they lasted for about three sessions each you know because because everything that Paul was asked to do felt like homework and he thought well no I just I just want to learn to play through essentially tab you know like guitar tab um right he wanted a quick fix and piano is kind of not like that it's definitely not like that. <laughs> but I also like the idea with the piano. I mean, every single piece of music in history can be played on the piano, you know, and you can't do that with other instruments, you know, I and mean, you have the bass and the treble together with the piano. That's something that I've always loved about it is that it's self accompanying. You know, yeah, mm. exactly. Mm. Well, you yeah. can play every piece apart from pieces that involve quarter tones and microtones, but yes, <laughs> I'm really into world music, so I have to point that out. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, really, really into, into the, ethnomusicology. I never really got into to the world yeah. music. Um, so I guess going into um, the meat and potatoes of the subject at hand, um, I'm interested to know Miss Cat, um, what interests you most about the world of the occult? What interests me most about the world of the occult? Mm. Um, I guess I have an instinctive feeling that this world as we see it and experience it is not real. And mm. I'd like to know what is real. And I kind of feel like the whole of my life has been a journey of figuring out what is real and the mm -hmm. occult really steps into that journey because i guess it's another method of looking at everything you know like you do with tarot or with anything mm -hmm. really you're you're trying to tap into what is really going on you're trying to see beyond your five senses right yeah and to really, yeah. that, that, that's the essence of it. It's just, is there something to all this um, sort of supernatural goings on mm -hmm. and mythology and legends and things, you know, is there something to it? Is There must be more to our reality than this. And I've instinctively mm -hmm. always felt that was the case. Mm -hmm. And I've read through lots of different religions trying to understand it and none of them really made sense apart from maybe buddhism how about you yeah um what interests me the most is esoterica and i actually um my and it's also like numerology i i'm fascinated with the sequences of numbers you know because i feel like that's what we're made of. Our very genetic DNA coding is like a computer, you know, and I, I just, yeah, it's about tapping in to the source that programmed you, I guess. Um, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. And no. I, I, you know, and I struggle because, you know, I am Christian in my beliefs, you know, and 
I do go through that um, sort of spiritual struggle because I, I, it's confusing. You know, you hear uh, one thing, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. And then you hear another thing and it's, it's just, it can be very muddy. And um, that's something that I've always felt a connection to is that source. Um, you know, I, I just don't think that all of this, all of us in the world could have happened by accident. I, I truly believe in an intelligent designer of our reality now. And, you know, that can go into Gnosticism too, you know, like we're <laughs> being controlled or whatever, like the matrix, you know, but I, I don't, I'm not into the Gnosticism, but it's, yeah. It's, no, but the Gnosticism is really interesting. I do, I do love the study of it. I mean, again, it's just people have always had this um, obsession or yearning to understand what is hidden from us. Um, yeah. And that is, I think, just something that is ingrained in our programming <laughs> to search for that source. And some people are more open to it than others, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I just think it's fascinating how everybody has their own level, you know, of showing that source. Like, I, I don't know. I think I'm going a little bit too space agey right now. No, I, I, well, you can go as um, space agey as you like because, you know, yeah. I, I don't feel that I'm particularly restricted. I mean, like, yeah. one of the joys, I think, of, of Buddhism is that it's very, very open ended. Um, I am specifically Rinzai, which is a form of Zen. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we are in a dream of God. That there's nothing that is actually not God, because everything is in his image. Everything, and by image I mean in his imagination. Right. So that's why we get the idea of everything being holographic. You know? Even even really cutting edge science physics talks about the world being holographic. And I think that's what yeah. it is. I think we are in the dream of God. And I think that's beautiful. And that's how that's how we all end up here and that's uh why life is so bizarre and why there are so <laughs> many wonderful um synchronicities everywhere. Mm. You know, I see the synchronicities in, in this story, in all of the music, the films, all sorts of things in, in this PID story. They're all over the place and it, they can't possibly have been placed there just by human hand because no one can plan right. that much. You know, only God could plan that much. Right. <laughs> I agree with you there. So. I agree with you 100 percent there you go yeah I, I think that's beautiful um trying to uh i don't know be spiritually aware open your third eye as it were you know it's it's hard to do and i consider myself very fortunate that i was blessed with the ability to see it because i have i've seen some some crazy supernatural stuff in my life and it's just affirmation to me that God is around me and God is listening to me and that's one of the reasons why I got pulled into tarot you know is it's the language of symbols you know Confucius said we speak in signs and symbols and that's what our reality is and the tarot just I feel like like the you know shake of the dice it's a random uh i don't know a random reflection of your soul i don't, I don't know how to explain that but it, i find oh. it very um you know because it's by it's obviously it's by chance we shuffle the cards we try to channel in energy like of a question or of a topic or whatever and i feel like 
the cards are basically a reflection of the person who's asking the question. So I, I look at it more as a uh, validation to the spiritual realm uh, than I do divination. Um, and yeah. I, I don't know, that, but that's, that's also a very muddy line, you know, because it is a form of divination. I realize that. Memoirs talks about tarot um, on fantastically page 93, 93 being a reference back to Thelema. Yes. What do you think about that? Those references Um, in memoirs. um, It's actually what um, got the creative juices flowing in me to actually sit down at the table and do a reading. Um, you know, just reading through, um, you know, which beetle represents what suit. And I find it funny because even in the, I noticed in the, I think it was in the Beatles cartoons, they show, no, it wasn't the Beatles. I'm thinking of an I Am I am a Phony video. Like he shows a box of beetle cards and they're all the aces and of, of, the, of the suit and each beetle is assigned to a different suit, um, but they're different. So I just find it kind of interesting how, you know, the memoir says that that, um, what was it, 19, I forgot the year, that yellow submarine deck where they, yeah, you know, that yeah, memoir I, talks about. And each beetle is assigned to a different suit. Yeah, in every deck they're assigned different suits, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I find that actually really interesting. Like, yeah, what, is, what is the I definitive form? Is it whatever it says in memoirs? Is that the definitive answer? Exactly. That. Thank you. That's what the point I was trying to make. It's how do how do we really know? You know what they stand for. Um, I think in doing uh, the explorations of each beetle um, in my tarot readings has kind of opened up a better idea of their archetypes. Um, I also try to use different decks to display that it doesn't matter what deck you use, those archetypes will always come through, and they have repeatedly. Right. Yeah, particularly so. in your archetypes cards, which were wonderful. Yeah, they're, it's an amazing deck. It, it really is. I think tarot is dismissed very quickly, and I think people tend to think that it is something demonic or satanic. I remember very much when I was 17 or so, and I was at sixth form, looks like being a high school senior. Mm. I remember doing tarot, sitting on the floor in the corner of, of the common room, which is like a communal room. And half the year group that I was in were uh, were Christian and they were evangelists. Mm. And I would get so much heat. You're doing the work of the devil. They would have a Victorian yes. fainting fit. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're left in like an existential crisis and full of dread because you don't know if you're, you know, if you really are or not. <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't. I, I just got tired of people trying to save me. I was like, oh, it's, yeah. it's cool. You know, like my grandparents used to do tarot all the time. You know, my, my grandparents, my mother's family, um, mm-hmm. were Roman gypsy. And mm-hmm. they did tarot. They did tassiology. They did palm reading. You name it, they did it. To me, it was totally normal. That's interesting because, <laughs> like, for me, it was totally taboo because I was raised in a um, non-denominational Christian household, mm-hmm. you know, and I, yeah. But I, I don't consider it to be um, demonic. I, I just don't. I think I have prayed and prayed and prayed about it. I have a very close and open relationship with God and, you know, my God. And I have asked, because in the past I've asked for signs or validation of some sort and I've gotten I've gotten it in some shape or form. You just have to be open to whatever form it comes in. Um, but I've my intuition is always telling me that I am in the right, that I am meant to do this. I'm 
I'm, I was made as an empathic person for a reason. And I was given these gifts to share with people and to show the love of God through my actions. That, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that all makes sense. It's just, it's very hard to explain to people because they, yeah, they just want to get judgmental and say that, you know, you're just, you're being delusional, you're working in deceit and, you know, you're just being lied to and that's fine. You know, if you want, if you believe that, great, you know, but I don't. So, you know, I don't go around smashing your dreams and smashing your passions or whatever you feel called to do. So what gives you the right to do it to me? You know, we all have our different stick basically. And I just, yeah, I don't get the hate that comes from all the ignorance, you know. Um, why. But I yeah. can't keep up bringing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. I, I had a curious yeah. upbringing. So, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, Yikes. you know, yeah. on one side, the Romani Gypsy, but the other side, my father's side were Irish and they were Catholic. So I... I know you don't think Catholics are Christians, and I understand that. I understand, but go with me on this. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I just, you know, and I know I've gotten into heated debates about my, my feelings there. But well, you know what? The fire and brimstone was real. <laughs> That's all I know. In my childhood, the fire and brimstone was real. No, I know, and I've, I've been there with friends and family myself, you know, and I, there are I, there was a time when I was learning tarot that I kept it very secret mm-hmm. and I didn't want people to know that I was into it. But again, you know, that's all gone away because I've, I've not been told otherwise. <laughs> I'm not one of those people that thinks that, oh, I talked to God and blah, or God talks back to me. Um, I talk to God, but I think he just answers me with situations and with people who come into my life. I, you know, and I, I, that's how I feel validation for what I do. And I think that the tarot being mentioned in memoirs is very prevalent because it is a major tool of the occult and the, um, you know, that's how they hide things from us is in that esoteric language and yeah you know it's very important to be open to it and to understand it before you make a judgment on it i totally get that so thinking about that and then on the topic of the you know occult and tarot and all of that you know shifting into the ideas of salima and Crowley, (laughs) do you see any sort of like positive characteristics in the philosophy of the Lima? Is there anything great that stands out to you? The way I look at the Lima, as I understand it, it's a lot of Eastern philosophy is corrupted. Mm. So at its root are ideas that not only do I agree with, I love and cherish and are the foundation of my own spiritual and moral beliefs, but the way that they are interpreted in Philema is frankly abhorrent to me. Can you give an example? It, it's difficult without going into lots of Buddhism, mm. and I don't want to have to yeah, explain too much because I'll, I'll bore people. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's possible. No, it... The, the, the entire nature of understanding uh, the universe and your place in it, mm. that the whole sort of moral stance, certainly in Buddhism, and I know that Buddhism was a thing that Crowley particularly looked at. Not right. my not my form. He he didn't look at Rinzai Zen, but still, um, I know that he studied it specifically. Um, mm. And I can see the roots of it in in what he writes. Mm -hmm. I do too. I can see it definitely. Um, And I I think it's definitely a perversion of what 
Buddhism is about and what it stands for. You know, because, for example, I suppose I'll, I'll try and I'll try this because it might be brief. <laughs> um, in Buddhism, because everything can be classed as God, everyone is God. Everything mm -hmm. is God. You know, the chair you're sitting on is God. Everything is God. And there's nothing that isn't. And I think they kind of took the idea of, you know, of an individual person saying, well, I'm God. And they really didn't understand that. Yeah, but so was everyone and everything else. Yes. Gotcha. You're not you're not special. Right. You're, you're no more special than anything or anyone else. Mm. Everything is God. That's the only sort of quick example I can think of that they've misunderstood when when a Buddhist says that I am God, it's not that I'm some megalomaniac making some crazy declaration. I'm saying that I am and so is everything else. And, you know, that goes into the whole um, Christian, you know, the Garden of Eden and the original sin, you know, it can definitely be uh, paralleled with with that as well is that the lie in the Garden of Eden was, was Satan telling Adam and Eve as that if they ate the fruit, they could become gods. They could become yeah. like God. I understand what you mean by that, but it's a totally different thing. It is. In, in, I, in their interpretation, I mean. It's a subjective thing in Thelema than it is a universal thing in Buddhism. Mm. Well, because, you know, when I say God, I, maybe I should clarify this. Um, when we say God, I can interchange it with the word universe. Mm. And, and frequently in Buddhism we do. We can switch back and forth because there's no difference. You know, God mm. is not, to us at least, mm -hmm. a, a guy on a cloud with a beard. It's, it's, right. not, it's not that. It's way bigger than that. It's mm -hmm. everything. It's all that there is. So... I'll leave I that. Understand. I'll leave that there. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. <laughs> do you see, I guess, to circle back, do you see anything positive coming from Thelema? Other, you know, because obviously they've perverted, oh. you know, your your entire belief system. But do you see anything positive coming no. out of it? Not at all. Okay. Nothing whatsoever. All right. I don't. I don't know how you can. I don't know how either, but. Mm -hmm. No, I said I don't know. I, I oh. don't know either. I, um, and I find it interesting because I remember doing a video on, and I did like the 11 points of the Luciferian doctrine or something like that, and you had paralleled it to the different points of Buddhism. And um, I should pull that up and take a look at it again. But I, rem I, I, I do remember you saying how perverted it all it all was and you gave specific examples in that video i just yeah. can't think of it right now but i so i understand what you're saying and where you're coming from i guess you know that there are parallels between buddhism and other eastern sort of philosophies and hermeticism mm. and i suppose that's maybe the common route if i'm being generous to them but that's about as, as as generous as i can be i don't think there's anything good about it no, I, I agree. I, I, see, I think nothing good can come from uh, serving one's self. I think that's Not where we are in, that's why we're in the position we are now in the world, you know, people just thinking about themselves and not the betterment of humanity, you know, and that's how you show the love of God, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, I can go with that. So, like, when you're researching and you know coming up with these amazing topics like you've even given me some great topics to do my tarot readings on yeah. which and those readings have come out amazing <laughs> like totally yeah. mind-blowing um do you ever now as a content creator do you ever feel like pressure to discover something new something like shocking uh, you know in this on this subject oh yes all the time all the time because I try really super hard to not cover ground 
that other people have already covered and I try hard to not you know step on other people's toes so yeah I, I feel the pressure quite a lot I mean so far I've got a really good list and I know the stuff that's coming up and it'll take me it I god I think at least another year at least another year just to get through the list because it's a long list yeah, but after well, that, I, it's like, I what do think, I do? <laughs> do I give up? Do I stop? I, I don't know. I think that you have discovered or have highlighted many, many new and eye-opening things and parallels. And I think your research is invaluable to not just the PID scheme of it, but to the whole metaphysical part of it. I think mm -hmm. you've done a really good job of, you know, oh. of discovering new things and bringing them to our attention. Yeah, I like the the, the um, synchronicities. That's what I really like mm -hmm. because Me they're too. everywhere. They really are everywhere if you're awake to it. Exactly. How about you? Um, so I mean, I don't I don't feel pressure. Um, I. Because I don't, I don't really think I've revealed revealed anything new and mind blowing. Um, I think with the tarot readings, I think that has brought something new to yeah, the I plate. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've they've revealed a lot of stuff, and I'm thinking about doing revisits with um, you know my past readings to kind of do. Um, yeah, like a revisit on the topic and see what the cards say a second time, um, kind of about the person or the situation at hand. And, um, you know, and that's the other thing, though, with tarot, it is kind of speculative. It's not factual, right? So you kind of have to take everything with a grain of salt. But I think after you see certain characters who come up over and over again, the fool he's in every and, spread and you, and you just say hi billy <laughs> exactly like hello welcome to the table <laughs> yeah you know it's um so i mean i i don't really feel pressure i feel more um excited that okay. i'm able to do something different your channel is really chill like you can <clears throat> do whatever you like really because you haven't been stupid like me and named it supernatural beetles <laughs> <laughs> it's like i can't do anything else now i'm i'm pigeonholed I, I don't i don't think so i mean because you think of how vast all these different things connect to the supernatural aspect of the beetles you know they were a huge part of programming for the world you know and so I, I don't think it's stupid because you have to, you know you, you always make it relevant to the Beatles or to Billy or you know the replacement conspiracy but you also talk about bigger topics at hand as well so yeah. I don't think you're pigeonholed uh, well, I, I definitely feel pigeonholed but that's okay because it's my own doing I really got like tired of um of dealing with the memoirs you know I, I I had to take a step back for a good few months you know because I just it's too much it's too much uh, heavy energy it's especially doing those readings that I did I you know I had a lot of really heavy readings and I know people probably think it sounds wacky or whatever but it really does take an emotional toll on me like I can feel sort of the um, vibe of what was going on or what's going on and I have no idea where that comes from but it's I, you always hear me say oh my gut is tightening it's always when my when I feel that knot in my stomach get tighter and tighter I know that I'm tuning into something yeah no that's fine no that makes sense I, I understand I get it I think um yeah but you know I love the fact that I'm able to be like tarot reader of this community. I think every community has a tarot reader or two on hand, you know, and at least in my experience. 
And I've only ever seen one other lady do a reading on Paul McCartney. And she didn't even know who the hell he was. <laughs> she, she did this kind of like uh, blind reading. He, I think she called him like Paul McCarthy. <laughs> that rings a bell. I think I may have watched that. Yeah. It, I mean, it came out like years ago. Um, kind of like a shot, you know, shoddy looking video. But I, I found that interesting. And that's that and the, you know, pages on tarot and memoirs like that kind of just made a connection in my brain one day and it's like I need to like share my gift with this community <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, I have seen other people do tarot on this story but they they've done it from a point of view of knowing nothing really about it and mm. it was just some sort of idle random thing that they did but you're in a very right. different position because you do know about the story and you do know about memoirs and you do have much more of a background in it and so when you do a reading, it's much more informed. Well, and I worry, though, too, that people would think that, like, I'm trying to connect dots where there aren't any, you know, or making stretches. But I really try to stay impartial, you know, to whatever's coming through the cards. So, um, yeah, and that's why I've been so, like, blown away with what's been revealed, you know. Some of them have been affirmations. Others have been kind of like WTF moments. <laughs> so it's just very, very interesting. It's yeah. been a fun process. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I love your reading. I think I started like last September. So I've almost, almost been doing it a year. Okay. And it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. I like it. And I love all the people who interact with me and who give me suggestions or send me emails or because I value what other people think about, you know, I want to hear what people have to say about it. That's one thing that I think connected you and me so much is how amazing <laughs> your replies are to the videos. Oh, yeah. Just I was always... all over your comment section. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's freaking awesome i mean if more people could be like that it'd be great because you were able to um bring more information to the table and also inspire me to do or explore other topics so mm -hmm. i think that's really cool how um we were introduced to each other that way you know and kind of formed a little uh relationship because it's nice to find somebody else that you can be a nerd about this shit with you know because not everybody understands yeah what you're I, talking about i talked to my brother a little bit but he knows nothing right. really about the beatles nor does he care he's a so, monkeys fan <laughs> um, honestly i oh, from a, fa a, a family of beatles haters that's my family <laughs> Why are you doing this, you stupid girl? They'll say to me. <laughs> Why are you wasting I come your time? From a long line of beetle haters. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Crush the beetle. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, um, I don't know. I I just think it's neat. Like you said, it's like a syn these synchronicities that come up, and it's really it's been fun. You know, um, I had, would you say the same? Like, are you having fun? I really like doing the research. Uh, it's endlessly fascinating to me. Mm, I, yeah. I, I don't love making videos. Can I confess mm. that? Um, cause I'm not very good at it and yeah, it takes up a lot of time and yeah, the learning mm. disabilities really get in the way. I mean, the thing that I'm worst at in the whole world is, is reading out loud. And on each of these videos, I have to write, I have to write narration and I read out loud. <laughs> so it's like, the irony is not lost on me. I think you do an excellent job. Like you're, I think you're very polished. So, you know, unlike me, I, I, I'm too lazy to edit out my mistakes, I guess. I don't know. But, oh, well, yeah, you I know, mean, I'm, I'm very uh, nerdy and I can't let anything slip. So if there's mistakes in my videos, you know, which there are a few, 
and I'm, I look back at it and, I, and I'm horrified with myself for this, the tiniest of errors. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand that. You become very, like, self-critical about mm. things. And, yeah, especially when you get assholes out there who ask if you're an AI robot. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> no one yeah. human. It's, it's true. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, that's what I, I moonlight as an AI robot. <laughs> yeah, people are funny. I've actually had a conversation with an AI robot about PID. He didn't want to talk yeah. to me. He's like, no, no, this is all nonsense. It just kept telling me over and over. <laughs> I'm like, so I don't think if the video was actually made by an AI robot that it would be as good. <laughs> that, it's funny because when I did, I did that Ask AI thing about um, giving me a poem about Paul McCartney, you know, the about the, yeah, and then Dave Kornblum was so awesome and put it to music. <laughs> I just thought that was so cool. Um, it's fun though to see what, what it has to say, you know, I still am like, write me an essay on the Paul, M Paul McCartney replacement conspiracy and it'll write like a four paragraph <laughs> essay about something. It's just kind of fun to see what they say, but they always chalk it up to conspiracy theory. So they do. They're yeah, programmed too. Like, I hate being called a conspiracy theorist just because I oh, want to think out of the box. No, no, yeah. I love it. I embrace you it wholeheartedly. It. I love it. I if you call me a nut, I don't care because I've been called yeah. that all of my life. So it's not anything new. Well, that might have a that might tie into your hermit nature, right? <laughs> I, I I like it. I I. Again, I just feel very grateful that I'm not some numb zombie walking around believing everything that's told to me. I'm very grateful for having like a background and an education in philosophy and learning how to discern and to listen oh. to people's I arguments. Yeah. It's yeah. Not everybody... Uh, does that I, I would say there's a very small majority of people out there like us and the rest of them are all you know just going day to day plugging along you know just zombies not not awake and I feel sorry for people like that but I also feel extremely blessed and grateful that I'm not like that <laughs> yeah I don't know no, I can I can relate to that yeah okay yeah, so I mean, um, really the last question I have is, you know, um, kind of talking about creating content. Um, like, why do you think that there's such a division in this community, if you want to call it? There's a division between researchers. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Like, do you have an opinion as to why this person has to be right and this person is wrong kind of dichotomy going on in this community. Do you have an opinion on that at all? Well, I mean, people in the PID community, if you want to call it that, I don't think it is a community, yeah. to be honest. Um, yeah. But people in this community um, are cliquey, mm. um, like everyone else. They're just mm. human like everyone else. And people tend to form alliances and loyalties right. to certain other people and certain kinds of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to fall into a trap of going, well, I figured it all out now. And so anything yes. else that comes along can't be true. And th that's the danger, isn't it? It's, it's constantly making sure and checking yourself that you're not assuming things. Mm -hmm. And I do that all the time. Um, sometimes I go back round on a topic because I catch myself going, no, you're, you're assuming things because you like to think in a certain way. And so therefore it must be true, but that, that doesn't logically follow. Right. And that's how people are, you know, they, they get into yeah. a rut, I suppose, of thinking in a certain way, a little groove. <laughs> Definitely. And I, I just think it's funny how, you know, that kind of 
clickiness or whatever carries into adulthood. <laughs> I just find that funny, you know. Um, and I find it ironic because, I mean, I, I agree. I think if we were a, com- if this was a community, we would all kind of be behind each other, supporting each other, all of us, you know. But it just feels so very polarized, you know, that, you know, this group over here thinks that, you know, Billy is a piece of shit. This group over here thinks Billy is great. This, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's, yeah, I I think that's where the whole community part breaks up, in my opinion, as well. But I just think it's funny how, you know, we, as adults, fall back into those patterns. And I, I just think that we're doing the research um, a disservice by, like you said, assuming that we know everything, assuming that there's nothing left to say, and assuming that we're, we're the ones who are right. You know, yeah. I, I agree. I think that's very dangerous, and I think it does a disservice to actually discovering the truth. Yeah, and I think there's a point actually in memoirs, I can't remember exactly what page it was, but I think it was a reference to I Am the Walrus, because people always think that 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 song is a reference to the walrus and the carpenter. And Billy says in there somewhere that, you know, when you assume that you know, it stops you from seeing what is actually happening, what is actually true. And he says that in reference to the idea of, you know, Lewis Carroll's um, poem being the reason why that song makes references to a walrus. But that's not true. I think it actually references several other other things. Mm. Yeah, I get it. The first chapter of memoirs is called Dreams of Paul. Do you ever dream of Paul or Billy? No. So I, I have never had a dream. Um... But I will read you the note I wrote back in the back of my edition of memoirs about an experience I had because, um, I, you know, they tell you to write it down in the back of the book. Oh, I scribbled so... all sorts of things in the back of the book. They're nothing to do with dreams, but yeah, go on. go on. Let me find it real quick. Okay, yeah, it says, dream of me and I will tell you more. Um, there's a mystical element in this book. So, um, yeah, so what I wrote is um, no dreams yet, but I did have a weird occurrence when I asked Billy to come into my dreams. I was shuffling tarot cards when I said it. I split the deck to shuffle again, and when I opened up each side of the deck that I had separated after I split it, I had the six of cups on my left side and the six of wands on my right. <laughs> so two sixes randomly as I asked Billy to meet me in my dreams. Um, it, it really did. I, I wrote, it literally sent chills down my spine and made my eyes well up with tears. It really tripped me out. And it still does. And this was on the 7th of April, <laughs> just a few months ago. Yeah, um, I had I had uh, one of my subscribers send me an email and tell me about a dream, a couple of dreams that he's had about Billy and how powerful he believes Billy to be as an occultist. You know, um, and I've heard a lot of people talk about that, and I obviously there has to be something to it, or else they wouldn't mention it in the book and they wouldn't tell you to write it down. You know. Um, yeah, so I've never had a dream, but I've had a lot of, I've had instances with my tarot cards. Well, I have had a dream of Paul, not Billy. Mm -hmm. I've dreamt of Paul and John Mm. and I dreamt, I went back in time and I found them and I convinced them to, uh, disband the Beatles. (laughs) So, um, not the dream that they were hoping for. (laughs) <laughs> was this before or after the pact with Satan? <laughs> <laughs> it was before, thank God. 
Yeah, so that that was the dream I had of Paul with John. I've never dreamed of Billy. I have dreamed of Crowley. Really? Yes, I have dreamed of Crowley. It was a really weird dream as well. I dreamt that I was um, in a bar on a beachfront, like something like the Caribbean maybe, and mm. the sand kept blowing in, and I was sweeping the sand back out, and it just kept blowing back in again. And the sound system came on, even though I didn't switch it on. And it just started playing a whole bunch of really random pieces of music and sounds and things, like, like a cut-up, but in audio form. Oh. And, and I kept stopping. I was stopping sweeping by this point. And I went over to the sound system to try and work out what was going wrong with it and why it kept randomly playing things. And then it stopped. And this voice came out of the speakers, and it was Crowley's voice. And he how, did, how did you know it was his voice? Because he's been recorded. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. I'm, and, just, I'm just asking, you know, if you just heard it in your dream. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he told me I was a stupid girl, a stupid, <laughs> ignorant girl who didn't understand the importance of his work and the work that his followers were doing. Really? Yeah, and he told me, you have been warned. <gasps> and then it just went dead. And the music came oh back on. And it was How gone. long ago was this? How long ago? I think it was the beginning of this year. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, uh, it's, that, it's like a little bit of chaos magic in your dream. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I woke up going, oh, challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Come on then. <laughs> I, I challenge you Ooh, I to a what, duel. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what the sand represents though. It must represent like I don't know, I'm thinking like a wishy washy foundation or I don't know, sand Because it has to mean something if it kept blowing back into your Well, I think it was yeah. uh, uh, I was losing a fight. <laughs> I think that's mm. what I was losing. I was losing yeah. a fight with the sand. <laughs> Maybe it was like the desert sand of Egypt. I don't know, but but oh my it, God, but you've been warned. I know he literally <laughs> did. I was like, "Come on, then." <laughs> oh my God, I'd I'd probably have to check my sheets after <laughs> after that one. <laughs> so oh, yeah, that's that, that that's really those are my out. dreams. I have really weird dreams, though. I'm I'm used to it. Yeah, really really weird dreams. You know, I I told you before. I when I was a little girl, I used to dream of being abducted by aliens over and over and over yeah. and over and over so i had that for about six years was it a dream though cat was it <laughs> <laughs> who knows cue the x-files music i know oh i loved x-files i was such a big fan yeah it was too <laughs> that's hilarious so okay. um memoirs claims that paul dreamt or knew about his death before it happened mm. Do you think that's true? I do. Mm. I do think it's true. I believe that's the only way that this whole thing could happen is with his blessing. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't think the other Beatles would have accepted Billy into the group without knowing this is what their bandmate and friend wanted. So... Mm. And I do believe in premonitions, you know, I do believe Oh, yeah, that I do. I just design, wonder yeah. whether his dreams were the result of mind control programming or were they genuine premonitions or a bit of both? And that's a very good question about the mind control, right? When you think back to him staying with the Ashers and how they hypnotized him to do yesterday, you know. So that's a very interesting question, actually. I think they were all mind control because... How did they just accept it? And they must have done. I mean, memoir says that very few people were actually threatened or blackmailed or whatever. Most people yeah. in Paul's inner circle did actually accept Billy. And I think right. they were conditioned to accept him. They must have been. That's a great point, actually. Yeah, I mean, because you think about anybody who's elevated in society, that they have to have some sort of connection to the elite and their programming and all of that. So I can definitely see what you're saying there. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, 
I do believe that it's possible to, um, well, obviously program people, but um, like hypnotizing them, you know, certain ways. And oh, that's a very good point. Well, I, when I, when <laughs> I read the section of memoirs, um, for example, that talks about Jim, Paul's dad, and the way that he, you know, gave Paul's things to Billy and he wanted him to wear his underwear and socks and things like that. You know, like his reaction was not a normal reaction. Like if my father, God bless his soul, I mean, he's not with me anymore. He died in 2016. But if I died and someone said to my dad, you know, cats died, he would have been in bits. Exactly. He, he would have been inconsolable. You would have been you, you so would have full of all of that stuff as like a memory or a token. Like, I, yeah, I, I get what you're you saying. You know, it just seems like a really wow. weird reaction to me. It wouldn't have been my reaction. Like, if I think about when my father died, I was inconsolable. I, I remember, you know, just screaming into the air, how can you be gone? over and over yeah. and over i was absolutely in bits because i loved him to bits he I'm was so my, sorry he was my favorite person in the whole wide world and, i understand uh, so, I, I have the same kind of relationship with my father exactly so i, so, I mean i don't understand so jim's reaction it doesn't make any sense unless he was you conditioned into it that's a great observation that somebody who has an experience like me who has an experience something like that wouldn't really take notice of I, I did think it was peculiar but I also kind of like didn't give it a second thought either so that's it's very interesting to think about well either that or we didn't really care much about him that's the only other conclusion and I don't think that's true I don't either so do you think his do you think Jim McCartney was mind controlled as well I don't know whether I mean people speculate whether all the the Beatles dads were freemasons or something like that whether they right. saw it as being part of the, you know a greater purpose doesn't it say somewhere that it all happened because of um an uncle of john's and that this uncle vouched for him and then the rest of them got pulled in i swear i saw that in the footnote there is something the about one of john's uncles yeah but i always confuse it with the other thing about when billy turns up on the scene and he is vouched for by one of his uncles who is a higher ranking freemason than him right right and i always get yes. the two bits confused in my head i've always wondered that too though the other beatles connections to it because i know that you can get into those societies by being vouched for obviously but it's also a very uh generational thing and i mean they had they had to have been very high up there. They had to be in the 32nd, 33 degree Masons who were orchestrating all of this. Mm. So it makes me wonder if Jim McCartney was, was he hypnotized? Was he programmed to just go along with it? Or did he just sort of like disconnect from reality when <laughs> his son wow. died? Yeah, I don't get that. I don't know, but I do know his reaction yeah. is not the reaction of a loving father. Right. Definitely right. not. So, mm. there Very we go. good point, Kat. There Very we go. Point. That's what I'm good for. I'm good for good points. Not good for much <laughs> else. <laughs> That's not true. Good for being crazy. Anyway, right. Um, all right. What is the purpose of memoirs? Is it just a set of puzzles to distract us? Or is it meant to educate those of us who are awake? Um, I, I would have to say in the spirit of duality, <laughs> um, both. Because I did that, that energy reading on the book, I got very bad vibes. And that's why I had to kind of like take a step back. Sure. Um, and... I think, yes, it, it's meant to educate those of us who are ready to receive the information. Um, but I, because it's a work of fiction, 
I do question what parts are real and what aren't. And I get tripped up sometimes and I start coming up with these like random weird theories in my head that I know if I like told somebody about, they'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, like (laughs) I often wonder if, you know, the replacement conspiracy is the fiction and the rest of it is real, like the the whole control mechanisms and stuff. But then we wouldn't have the main foundation of the book if that were true. So I don't know. I find I find myself doubting what's real and what's not. Um, I have been educated from it <laughs> um, on, in various yeah. different ways, you know. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think I sort of mostly agree because... Definitely, there is lots of puzzles and riddles to yes. it. Um, and they do like sort of dangling us off a hook. Yeah. That's how I feel. We're going to tell you just enough to make you interested and then drive you crazy because you know you can never properly answer this. <laughs> yes, and that's exactly how I feel sometimes when I'm looking at certain parts of it. You nailed, you nailed it on the head right there. <laughs> but at the um, same time, you know, I think Billy is trying to share things with us because particularly from his point of view, he's had this incredible life as someone else and most people don't know who he is. And I guess right. he's at a point in his life where, you know, he's like, actually, it was me. Guess what? <laughs> it was all me. Yeah, exactly. And I feel empathetic towards him in that regard because... He has done so much, so much incredible, so many projects. And yes, he's used different names for different projects. I get that. But he, as William Shepard, has never had his name attached to that catalog, except for in the realm of conspiracy, right? I feel for him on that level. Um, and, you know, I, that it kind of brings me to something I was wondering, too, is like, do you generally like Billy as a person? Like, what are your feelings about him as um, a person? I try not to think about it, but <laughs> no, because otherwise I won't be objective. Right, right. But I do feel a compassion toward anyone who has obviously been abused. Um, he says that he was uh, he was a victim of um, SRA. Yeah. I suspect right. he was probably sodomized. Right. And that's very, very sad. And I can only feel compassion for someone who's been through that sort of torment. But then that's on the other level, point. you know, he is part of a cabal that wants us all dead. So but, he, but he also didn't ask to be like that. So again, it's like he wasn't born into free well, will. He was born uh, to serve the will of others. So. Sure, but I judge a man on mm. his choices. That's who you are. You are your choices. Right. And you can always walk away. He right. could have walked away right at the very, very, very beginning. And it's because he didn't that it gets harder and harder and harder to be able to do that. Do you get to a point of no return? That's what he he continued the Paul McCartney name when he went solo, you know, he could have just, he could have bailed at that point. They could have killed off the character. Yeah. Yeah. that's, That's a good point, you know, and, but I also feel like he didn't have much of a choice either. Like it's kind of a, paradox because it's like yes he's made these choices but I kind of think he hasn't really had the opportunity to oh no yeah I get that I get that he's in a very difficult position you know I'm not Mm. hard-hearted but I do every now and again just read page was it 557 and I read that big footnote and then I think to myself well look at what we're up against right are you looking up the footnote? Uh, yeah, I am. Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, yes, I have to have the reference in front of me. Um, 
yeah um, it's where they lay out their plan the polism yeah the beatles and the others yeah yeah it's where they the lay out the soul. plan you know yeah, he's going he's to be a god Ugh, that's the other thing that just the whole he's the um you know avatar of Horus, or he embodies god so you know i don't know maybe he does it's very bittersweet as far as yeah it goes you know because i can see all sides of it and obviously um i shouldn't sympathize too much with somebody who's spent his entire life working on generating society and morals so <laughs> yeah, i think we're probably in concord we can see both sides we can be empathetic towards someone who's been in a very difficult position but at the same time yeah. we are on the receiving end of all the deceit so you know it goes both ways i like guess Stockholm syndrome kind of right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> kind of is and it's um yeah and you bring up the whole you know sra stuff like again that's something that just like shattered my soul when i first read that you know um yeah. because i had learned about sra and all of that years ago um before i knew about mr billy and then you bring in the whole moon child and sun child concept to it all as well it's just you know he was born in a very weird circumstance and very unfortunate but oh yeah but at the same time yeah fuck him <laughs> I, I like his music and sometimes you have to separate the artists from their Art. body of work yes yeah mm -hmm. So in memoirs, we learned that Billy also played Vivian Stanzel from The Bonzos. What do you think about that? And when did you first come across The Bonzos? I first came across The Bonzos through The Ruddles. <laughs> um, and that was probably a good 10 years ago, maybe more. I mean, I know it was in like my early 30s, late 20s when I... Okay. Uh, when I saw the ruddles, all you need is cash. <laughs> Great film. I loved it. Yes. Loved it. And then so I started, then I got into the whole Monty Python thing. And then um, Neil Eines is just an amazing. Innes. Innes. Okay. Well, I always think Eines. Innes. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, yeah, I, I've always liked him a lot. And so I, you know, realized that the Bonzos were in collaboration with the Monty Python boys before Monty Python, you know, um, Michael Palin and Terry Jones. Didn't they, weren't they the band for like a Saturday morning program? They were the band for uh, Do Not Adjust Your Set. Yes, that's Which right. was actually launched on the same day that Magical Mystery Tour was first aired in the UK, mm -hmm. Boxing Day interesting so there you go i've i knew about the bonzos before i knew about billy and viv and obviously uh other researchers have done an amazing job at showing you know i know uh, ralph pacheco out there he's done amazing like face morphine pictures to show how billy and viv are the same and I became aware of that, obviously, just a few years ago. Mm. Um, but I've known the Bonzos because I've, I've always been a total nerd for anything English. Um, you know, I lived out there. <laughs> and when I was growing up, I loved, like, Absolutely Fabulous and um, Monty Python, the movies and stuff. And, I, yeah, I, I love comedy. And yeah. so, you know, you start exploring like the people who are in the shows and then you go down different extensions of what they're working on that's how I found the bonzos first and listening to their songs I get their songs in my head almost every morning the Aww. Jollity Farm song is always oh, yeah. in my head <laughs> yeah. 
and um, yeah I, what about I, you i knew monty python first mm. and then then off the back of the beatles the rottles and then off the back of that the bonzos but i really have um one of my school friends back in the 90s to thank for introducing me to the bonzos specifically because her parents were hippies from the 60s and 70s and they had the most incredible record collection that included actually a, quite a lot of comedy records so i i already had quite a lot of the monty python records as a kid um i'd had those i mean even preteen i had those mm -hmm. so very early on um but yeah one thing kind of led to the other and I was an art student for a while as well as a music student and I remember one of the albums there was only a handful of albums that we would sort of collectively agree that we would play communally to the group and one of them was Gorilla which was the Bonzo's first album mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah I, I love so much fun love all of that and I was so stunned I remember when I read that about Billy being Viv, I was stunned. <laughs> I was so stunned. Yes. What they can do with silicone and, you know, you can make a woman look like a man, you know, <laughs> just crazy things. It's possible. You yeah. just, you know, and you can definitely see it in the Magical Mystery Tour and his performance. You can definitely see it's Billy. Oh, yeah, from and the body like, language. Yeah, the mannerisms, everything. Yeah. It's yes, dead absolutely. giveaway. I don't know whether it was addressed to me or not, but I'll I'll take it, I guess, that when I talked about that before on another video, that uh, the whisper messages were in the next version of memoirs, and they talked about Viv, you know, the, the ginger geezer being yeah. related to the red priest that was Vivaldi, and on another mm. page there was a quote from Big Shot, which was my favourite track, on Gorilla, uh, and I just thought, uh, hello, they're having a laugh with me here. <laughs> it's brilliant. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's brilliant. And that, that makes me wonder, you know, do you think they watch our videos? I know Tom watches my videos. Um, I have conversed with him here and there through email over the last few years. Um, so I have to think that he's made certain people aware of my videos as well. I, I can't say for sure, but I do have a kind of a gut feeling that Billy does. I would be surprised if, if they hadn't. Yeah, well, and that's what I mean, because I know Tom has seen it, um, has seen my videos and my readings and has thanked me for them, which but was what made me keep going, you know, because he said yeah. that the very first one I did sounded excellent and right. <laughs> so I was like, OK, I'm going to keep going with this. So I have to think that, yeah, he, he let Billy know about it. Um, I, what do you think about your channel? Do you think they've watched yours? I've been told by others that uh, are in contact with Tom that they sent one of them to him. The one I did about um, the whisper messages. I know that Tom watched that one, whether he or anyone else has seen any of the others, I don't know. I would imagine that they have tabs on anybody who's doing something different in the area, exploring a little bit more. I oh, just speak. They're all about the underground element of this book, right? <laughs> the yeah. um, keeping it kind of hush hush and just letting it spread naturally and organically. So we're the propagators of the material basically when we highlight it and analyze it so yeah i mean i think i definitely think that they have tabs on us i think that when we talk about things it gives them sort of a permission to then go further so mm -hmm. that in the next edition they'll flesh out the story a bit more it's what it feels like because it's like they updated it right they updated it last year in october and then they did another update. Yeah, I think it was November yeah. and then again in April. November and April, yeah. April yeah. Fool's Day. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't long. 
Yeah. No. Was it six? So, yeah. So I, I definitely think they know people want more. That's why they added more the whisper messages and all the pictures and all of that, which they're fun, but I also think they're a little bit of a distraction. <laughs> um, Do you find them distracting? Well, it's kind of like too. It, it depends on how you're reading it. You know, like they say, you should read it once all the way through without looking at any of the footnotes or any of the codes or the emboldened Yeah, I words did that. I was stuff. very obedient. <laughs> well, that's something like when you sent me that list, uh, you know, the whisper messages, and you were mm -hmm. like, here, here they are. I typed them all up for you. I was blown away like that because I could barely make out. I think I did like the first 50 pages. Oh. Oh, I was sat there with a torch for a week. I, <laughs> it was crazy. I, I know I'm getting older now because I need bright lights to see shit like that. I just can't. So I, I was grateful that you that you did the work and passed it on to me. So thank you for that. And I know everybody else out there loved that video. So yeah. I did do as I was told. I read it all the way through and I made notes on each chapter. I'm such a nerd. And then I went back and then I typed up all of the emboldened bits and I typed up all the the acrostic reading. Mm -hmm. Um and then I typed up all the whisper messages. So I've got files on all these things. I can go to those files just to a search on a keyword. Yeah. You see? organized you're you're so organized and like so on it and oh, I, I love that <laughs> I'm the total opposite so you I know, know. I, think, I think it's great well that's why I love you <laughs> I know well there you go fire and air right air kind of gets fire going so there you go <laughs> I don't know I just think it's um I always think about what you what you said to me months ago about you know like how our video styles and approaches reflect our astrological signs and i just i thought that was such a great observation on your part because it's very very true <laughs> so and i i keep that in the back of my mind and yeah i I think that was a great observation that you had made and it just kind of made me feel better about, you know, yeah, I make kind of rough videos sometimes that have mistakes or whatever, but that's, that's just me and that's my style, you know? And it just kind of helps. You get them me. out so much quicker and I, I take too long to do everything. So we're, we're different like that. What do you think is your best video that you've made so far? Oh my goodness. Um, oh, it's like a tie. <laughs> um, I think it's a video called The King of Cosmania. I made okay. it, um, oh God, like months ago. It was like one of my first videos and it was because it was exploring the footnote in the Donovan chapter about Billy's uh, sadistic torture from an, uh, you know, ancient German occult method or whatever it says. And, you know, just when I, when they say stuff like that, you know, it's easy to just kind of like breeze by it and be like, oh, okay, he, you know, was tortured by Germans or whatever. But it just, but it stuck with me and I'm like, okay, so what method and what, where is this coming from? So I like did a little deep dive and just found like the fraternitas saturni and yes i remember you know, all of that you did a really good job on yeah. that yeah but, and it's weird because it's like kind of an extension of another video i did about saturn worship right it's all kind of connected and just going deeper into that i think that was one of my my better ones that one and my alchemy video okay. introducing the concepts of alchemy yeah, because I think that's something that is very, very vital to esoterica in general, because it's the basis of what these societies are aiming for, you know, is to unite the world as one, get rid of duality, 
all of that stuff. And I, I think it's, um, it's in everything that has to do with conspiracy, you know, is alchemy and the Soviet coagula. You know, look at look at Maui right now. You know, they're they got that island got obliterated by fire, right? And then now they're going saying that they're going to rebuild it into the world's first like smart city. What a coincidence! Exactly. So <laughs> it's the phoenix. It's all of that stuff. It's probably two videos that I I'm most proud well, of of doing. Um, I I like those, and obviously I love all your tarot reads. But Thank I think you. the the deep dives that you did on um, Barry Miles and John Dunbar were also really good. The International Times. All Thank of that. you. Right. I'm still going to be making videos on stuff. Um, there are so many more articles to highlight. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think those characters are very important. And there's still other characters in the mix that I, I need to highlight, too. John Hopkins. And then the evil trinity of Leary, Ginsburg, and um, Burroughs. You know, I'm working on a video right now. Or you know, I'm trying to construct my stuff about the relationship between Burroughs, McCartney, and even Crowley very interesting in the whole counterculture business so i i think it's just important because it was a propaganda piece to push the counterculture onto people and it screams luciferianism and they all have the same concepts of freedom like barry miles said <laughs> you know freedom to do you and do what thou wilt yeah so thank you i mean that it means a lot to me actually because <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't think too many people are into learning about that ever since I kind of saw it highlighted on the I am a phony videos I have been interested in it and once you start reading the articles even the advertising it's just so like new age and it was unlike anything else that had been in circulation before yeah, so what what do you think your best video has been? I, I don't know. I mean, as far as I was concerned, the first three were the really salient stuff, and then after that it was just following a list. I feel like I'm on a train on rails, and I'm going one way <laughs> down the list, <laughs> and I'm not stopping until I, you know, hit something. <laughs> I personally loved... The cardomancy of the Beatles video you did because okay. I'm obviously I'm a tarot reader and I just loved how you eloquently put the connections between the tarot and the Kabbalah all in these beautiful slides with you just did a great job and I think that's in my opinion one of your best but the Beatles cartoons man blew my mind I'm sure mm -hmm. it, <laughs> yeah Sure, it blew your mind too when you were. Because I remember mind. you like messaging of... me, like, "Oh my God, look! I guess what I found out." And blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, good on you for doing that. Like, there's 39 episodes, and each one's about 19 minutes long. Mm. So, mm -hmm. and I watched all of them twice. I watched them through once, and um, I sort of took note of the episodes that seemed like more interesting than others. Right. And then I watched them all again, took screenshots, made proper notes, and that was the basis of the video. But when I got well, to the one about, the one that was on the weekend that Paul died, that yeah. just blew me away. It's wow. creepy as that, and then the numerology matching up to it, too. <laughs> That's the other thing, like the episode numbers seem to correlate with the theme of yeah. the cartoons the very last one they'd saved the best for last when they worked in the story the legend of arthur into the background pages of that cartoon and mm. i sat and worked that out i was like what am i looking at here because they're not very clear and i can only see fragments um and I worked out what book it was, and I worked out what page it was, 
and then I looked wow. at it and just went, "Oh my god, <laughs> holy moly!" <laughs> you it's know, amazing. It talks about like, you know hitting someone over the head and yes, you know, them. and the trans the soul transmigration the day before he died. It's just so creepy, mm. you know. And I remember we got into this conversation too about how they pr- how they're programming kids, you know, with these cartoons yeah. and. Like my daughter, I you know she she knew what the Illuminati was way before I even told her about anything like that. You know, just just from watching Gravity Falls or whatever cartoon on TV, because it's and so this is another thing that they concentrate so much on the occult, on the devil, on religion in general right yeah. but yet they say that there's no god if there's no god why is the focus always on evilness in the world does that make sense like um you can't say that god doesn't exist while you're sitting here spouting your doctrine out to the world you know to make them believe that there's no god or no creator out there well um, i think that's one of the biggest... they, they do believe in a god but it's not yours i get that but it's they want to tell you that there is no spiritual realm there is no um other principality around us but what we see in front of our faces I think that that's probably more a communist line of thinking because to have a spiritual life is to have an escape and they don't want you to have an escape not even in your mind yes you know and so that's what communism does. One of the first things oh, it God. does, one of the first things it does is get rid of all the religion. It doesn't matter what religion right. it is. It's you, you cannot have an out. You cannot have any right. form of escape. There can only be the state. There can only be the way right. that their rules and their way of you know, doing everything, you know, they, they, there can only be room for that. Mm-hmm. So I suspect it's probably yeah. more to do with that, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. I just, I feel like the spiritual side of things gets overlooked way too much. And I think that it gets overlooked because it's not taken seriously by those who control the media. So like you said, there they there's more atheists today than believers in any religion. You know, people don't really believe in God at all anymore. Um, and I think that that's a result of the programming that they get. Yeah. yeah, they believe in the doctrine of science. Even though evolution is just a theory, just like, you know, creationism is. It's, they want to say it's fact. <laughs> well, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, Okay. We'll definitely wrap it up. So, um, is there anything you want to say about, like, future plans or anything like that? Do you want to plug your channel just if you're interested in checking out you know different oh, topics that surround tarot and spirituality and the <laughs> paradigm of evil that we're living in <laughs> come over to my page and check me out <laughs> um i think i just try to make content on stuff that interests me and like i said for future plans i'm definitely going to be doing more international times highlights and i'm going to be doing some tarot revisits so yeah i mean and then i'm working on a a video for uh just showing the relationship to burroughs and mccartney and all that jazz so yeah what about you what's on your what's next on your list what's on my (laughs) list oh the list is really private and the, risk, the reason why the list is really private is because I'm usually working on three videos at once. And I put out whatever one finishes first. <laughs> See, I would think that you'd be totally the opposite. That you would just zone in and focus on Oh, I do one. at a certain point, you know, because I'm, I, I go back and forth and I'm still doing research and putting things together. But at a certain point I go, no, you need to actually finish this one. Just, just gonna have to put the other two on the back burner for a few days (laughs) and just finish this one um 
so do you see yourself like being a content creator for like say like the next handful of years or are you do you see yourself reaching a certain point and you know just saying that's it that's all I gotta give that was my plan I get through the list and then I'll wave goodbye but who knows mm. there might be other things to talk about I mean several times I've made videos that weren't on my list just because there was something came up and it was so pressing it had to be done right and the whisper right. messages video is a classic case of that because I, I didn't know that they were going to happen. And they were there in the next edition and uh, had to be addressed. I think we were all on the edge of our seats wondering what the hell updates they could make, you know. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I've had a lot of fun um, looking into this stuff. I'm slowly getting back into looking at the memoirs again. Um, I'm glad I took a break from it because I'm recharged and I'll, you know, start looking a little bit closer at stuff. I wonder why he doesn't talk more about the international times and that kind of period, um, in the memoirs, you know, he doesn't really ever talk about his relationships with those people, um, because it was the real Paul that's started it and then Billy walked in and took over you know and uh, I just wonder about that too and all those characters Miles and I know John, John Dunbar's dead now but Miles is still alive I just I, I wonder about him sometimes and I wish Billy would have talked a little bit more about his relationship with the avant-garde world maybe he doesn't as a courtesy to them Maybe. That's a good point. Not pulling them in. Well, I mean, it's been fun because I've, you know, gotten to build relationships with people. And, like, I'm so happy to be in collaboration with you and to have your support. And it makes making content enjoyable. <laughs> well, it's have. been fun. It's been really fun to hook up with yeah. you and to collaborate with you and I'm very grateful when you've done readings for me. Anytime. Okay. All right. Brenda? Sounds good. Yep. Say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>